one of the things that um, I see is some some of the banks changing their policy to make like to to kind of hamper the difference, right? Interest rates are rising. People are getting a little bit scared. They might not want to borrow as much. But then some banks, I can't remember which bank it was. I think it may have been Westpac. Um, they dropped their how they assess your rental income. So are there any other policies that you're seeing that are favoring property investors to maybe make it easier to, because I mean, at the end of the day, banks want to lend money. They want to give people money. Um, they want to lend it out so they can get a, take a clip of the ticket. Um, are you seeing any policies shifting and changing? Well, that the one that you mentioned is the one that is changed, but did it change because of inflation or anything else? Or did it change because rental properties are scarce and there's lower vacancy? Uh, so what we're talking about is the rental change where the buffer of the bank was take uh-huh. if you had $100 a week in rent and they would only assess you on $80 a week in rent. And then what lenders would do is they'd look at your, um, depending on what where you are in your investment cycle, they might look at your individual tax return and look at your expenses minus the interest minus the capital deductions and find what your actual rental costs are and then deduct put that on as an expense as well over and above the 80%. So what what the this particular what your what Westpac did is um, and a couple of others is went to using ninety percent of your rent versus eighty percent. So that's that's a nice little positive windfall. Um, depending on how many properties you have, that could equate to a nice amount of money thrown back on the table for your borrowing circumstances. Now all the other buffers still remained. There was still um, investigation in property expenses. Um, you talked about your off the plan unit block or what if it was the unit that's on the 40th floor with pools, spas, saunas, underground car park, Mm -hmm. multiple lifts that your strata fees are are just skyrocketing as well. So you could get rent in of $300, but you're you're paying way more out because you've got all your other expenses. So that property is um, on the Bellerin calculator is less too. So are we seeing other other things? Um, We're only seeing in the different, um, in the differing lenders from say the majors, uh, we're seeing that some lenders are still doing 2%, 2% buffers. Some people, how they look at existing debt or other people's debt on the calculator is still a big thing to help borrowers keep borrowing. Um, and then looking at how they treat a whole range of other structures that are out there to, to continue borrowing. So not much has changed uh, too much there just yet, but I think right. they're, they're, if we want to get speculative, I'm not a regulator. So um, I feel like if the banks want to continue borrow lending there's there's going to have to be some sort of sort of mechanism of change or or not we might want to they they might want to crush it a little bit more and see what happens what would that be what would that what do you like crystal ball what, what what are some of the things that you think would be a smart move for the banks well the things being thrown around maybe they'll reduce the buffer from three to two percent um uh, but I, I'm not seeing any communication related to that. There's been some other, they might get other things around some of the mechanisms of borrowing more than 80%. They, they are looking at the first home buyer market a lot coming up in the next few months. So um, I'm not sure whether if, if we stimulate the market in the first home buyer area, what that'll do to property prices. So that might actually fix the, the valuation potentiality of what we talked about before because we've got a lot more first home buyers and the government's throwing going to earn 30 percent of your house how that's going to help with valuations for the property investor so i don't think there's going to be too i haven't seen anything on the horizon related to too much on the on the lender lender basis um there's always lenders out there asking for feedback and we're providing feedback to them all the time and there's always new lenders coming out so we'll watch this space um the the peer-to-peer lending space is quite an interesting area where they get a lot more control on would people like why are people not taking um fixed rates uh as an option like it, it, i mean you give out advice to individual client circumstances can you think of a reason why uh aunt um meryl you wouldn't give him or her <laughs> uh, why would you say you know what i don't think fixed rates for you or how, how would that kind of look <laughs> um as a mortgage broker, we prevent, we provide options to the client. So we will filter, well, yeah, I will filter what's your client circumstances, what's the policies that fit that, and what are the set of lenders that are going to fit, fit that model. And those set of lenders are going to um, have different fixed rates and different variable rates. So obviously, we've got to fit the policy um, of the bank first, and then it's an option provided to the, to the client. 
Now, we can get a little bit more complicated in the serviceability calculators about what's affordable. So where we look at a floating rate of 3% for the buffer of the bank, so we get a, a 5% interest rate, now they're assessing at 8 and we get a fixed rate and say it's 6 um, they usually have a behind-the-scenes um, revert rate. But it, let's take it simple. If you are borrow, going to the bank and borrowing at 5% and getting assessed at 8 um, we'll take a simple calculation. Just say the fixed rate plus 3% is now 9 Your borrowing capacity could be limited as well. Um, so that's an interesting point to take into account. The other one is um, a lot of people are seeing that uh, we like cheap things. So when you present a fixed rate to a variable rate, um, I don't know who wants to pay a percent more right now. And there is also when we have sensationalization in the media related to fixed rates and things falling off cliffs and stuff, you've got to put it in perspective. Like, will it be up that long? Will it go higher? Maybe, maybe not. Um, do you want to take, take, take the reverse preparation? Like if your fixed rate's coming off, what if your variable rate's going to go up? Are you putting away money? If you're paying 5% now and you're going to go to 6 are you putting away money as if it was six into your offset account, uh, mm -hmm. even on your variable rate? Um, if you can afford, if the bank tells you you can afford eight percent and you're paying five percent, where are you putting another three percent? If the banks mm -hmm. are that conservative, where are you putting the other three percent? Just simple mathematical calculations. Every person's circumstance different, and every every desire for a property investor to put their principal, if they're even on interest only, which is another conundrum of fixed and interest only because usually those terms match themselves and coming off that can, can change a whole range of calculations and whether yeah. you can get it back or not. So yeah. that's, a, that's another one. So where are you putting, if you're on interest only, where are you putting your principal that you would normally pay on the investment property? Are you putting off your owner occupied? Are you putting it in your offset accounts? Are you desiring to pay this property off versus that? So there's a whole range of other things that come into that mix. Can you give us um, a mm. high-level overview of what the difference between an offset and a redraw is? And I know this is probably uh, basic stuff, but I don't think everyone knows the difference. Um, Fair question. Well, can I give the, the the sort of the shock story that came out in the last couple of years from one of the lenders? They oh, actually right, locked, yeah. locked up people's redraw. And then due to a bit of pressure, they uh, reinstated it. So... Um, very interesting if you want to unpack that. There was a particular second tier lender that's now gobbled up by another second tier lender that resides in a Sunshine Coast. Um, so the. <laughs> I feel like that's an inside it's broker as bad joke. As my client name. Yeah. Like, this yeah, is yeah. terrible. <laughs> <laughs> redraw, redraw is when you, if you pay, a th I just use round numbers, if you pay a thousand, if your contracted payments a thousand bucks a month to your mortgage and you pay two thousand dollars that means there's a thousand dollars over and above your current payment that you can redraw back okay so typically redraw is more commonly on your owner occupied property because when you put money in you save interest and you draw it back out say your um, hot water uh, new stove new vacuum plant whatever the the case is that you're doing hopefully it's on improving the house um that that's cool um there's no no taxation things there's no other things that come into that metrics but when you use redraw on an investment property and you put money in and you pull it out that is something that you probably have to consult your um, accountant on related to what you use those funds for offset account is a bank account it's separate to your mortgage totally separate it's a bank account under the bank account um, guidelines and policies and stuff and the bank allows you to have this um, link to from that bank account to the mortgage so if you owe a hundred thousand dollars and you have $100,000 in your, in your offset account, you don't pay any interest on that $100,000. Now, your mortgage hasn't gone down a cent. You're just not mm -hmm. paying the interest. If you use your offset account to um, go, go and get a, a highly inflated Macca's ice cream from the 30-cent cone that I remember it, um, you're not going to be... Uh, it's, it's used for purposes of personal purposes, but your mortgage hasn't changed but you now are paying interest on that, that soft serve that you just consumed. How much is a soft serve now? Oh, isn't it like a dollar or something? Oh, it's outright. It's like both. So like what you're saying is with a, co with a, with a, with a flake. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've got $10,000 extra in your, in your redraw, um, that's offsetting the mortgage in a way Correct. because it's in the redraw. And then you've got an offset account, which has 
um, ten thousand dollars, and that's offsetting the the mortgage. Yep. The difference is one is actually a bank account that you can easily dip in and out of yourself. Literally, you could go to the ATM if you had yep. a high enough limit and pull all of that money out. But with a redraw, how do we get access to our funds? Like yeah, how so, does so, yeah, the bank account, you can have a card depending on the bank, all that nice stuff. Um, and with your redraw, you typically, in, in the main, most people would remove it from their um, home loan into a bank account to then access the funds. Um, or, or move it into their offset account. So it depends on the strategy setup that you've got. Um, some, I ha some banks' policies may, if you dig into them deep enough, I know one of them may allow you to be paid from your home loan and a couple of other things like that, which is just some com competition in the marketplace. But in the main, your offset account, you can go and pay out using a card. You can't typically do that with your mortgage. And it all comes back down to the strategy. We've most, most commonly, we find with property investing, we find more offset accounts. Yeah. Um, because of the type of debt and the deductibility that sits in there. And yeah. with the owner occupied, we see a combination of redraw or um, offset accounts. So that's, that's the, the commonality that I see. Is there a benefit uh, to having a redraw? It doesn't sound like a great bloody thing. Um, well, there are terms and conditions that the banks can, can lock it up that we sort of alluded to. They no, no, that's the bad. Very, I want the good. <laughs> they wouldn't be very popular if they did it. And that's why they reversed it. So, it, there's there's the same it's the same mechanisms it's just how like if you pay down your investment property and you pull out some money to renovate your owner occupied you may lose some deductibility so that's where the offset accounts come into it so consult your accountant on that one is there like a limit to how often i can ping you to ping the banks to give me a cheaper interest rate like if they keep bumping up interest rates for the next three months six months whatever or if they drop them or whenever can i do that every three months can i do that every six months like is there a limit to how often i can do because i'm sure there's a whole heap of people sitting there now going well i just refinanced maybe in q3 2022 should i refinance at the end of q1 2023 or q2 2023 or is that too short is that too close is that not on par like how do how should people think about it Cool. So number one, it depends whether you need more money and what your goal is. So if you don't need any more money, this is, this is the tips. If you don't need any more money, it's best to ring your current bank. One of the things we don't want to get involved in is if you're re refinancing every three months, you're hitting your credit file all the time. And that could have another, uh, another interesting conversation to be sitting there as well. But hit up your current bank. Have a comparison. Um, I had, a, I had a, a lady call me up about her rates and she was sitting at 1.5% um, higher with, this, with the bank. They went to the, the bank that they were at. We, I said, let's jump onto that bank's website and see what they're offering the new, new, new customers. They were offering the new customers 1.5% less. So I said, cool, we've got our competitor called themselves. Ring them up and see what happens. They rung them up without question they got the current rate that was on their website without question at all, one and a half percent off. Now that person didn't ask for a rate reduction for over eight to 10 months. And I'd say, even if you haven't asked for something in six months, call them up because they, they will, will probably be in that vicinity because they've just been piling it on top of what's been going on and not comparing, not reducing you back to where the new customers are getting. So that's where I go. And if they are offering something similar to what, if, if you've got a better rate from another provider and the current bank's website doesn't give you the, a better rate than you're on, you can use the competing product and give that to them and say, over the road, Joe Bloggs has given me this, you need to give me this so you can retain me. You can do it that way as well. Sometimes they play the game, sometimes they don't. You can ask as much as you want. It's always free to ask a question. Um, Joe jo knows it's free to ask. Free to offer to put, put an offer in on property. It's free to ask a question with a bank. It's only when you 100%. start signing things, you're in trouble. So, yeah, keep asking. Um, I've tested not this. There's, not, not, if there's, not if there's a good calling off. <laughs> yeah. There well, you go. I've, depending, on the, depending on the state. South Australia, you're gosh, pretty, you're pretty good just throwing, throwing gosh, off. Um, this is literally so it's funny. Asking. I call, I called you the other a couple a couple months back actually, um, Aaron, and we had this conversation. Um, and you said to me something that I was like, I haven't forgotten. You said, "Yeah, go onto their website and then 
apply to cancel your loan, like go through the oh, yeah, cancellation process. Can yeah. you talk to that? Why, yeah, why so, did you give me that? <laughs> so one of, one of the things that we, we can do, what, before I refinance someone that doesn't need any more money, we want to make sure that their bank doesn't want them anymore because um, I, want to, I want to validate making, making the time and the space for, you, for the client and I want to make sure that we're not going to get tripped up at the end where we can act in the best interest by remaining at the same lender by doing all the work for nothing. Um, not trying to be selfish, but we, we, we want to serve as many clients as we can. Um, <clears throat> so going to, going to the bank with their current rates or using a competitor, get their rate down as far as you can and still not happy. If you're still not happy or you've gone to your broker and they've done the automated thing and they're still not getting the result you want. What I've found um, is when we've had banks that stop you from downloading a discharge form and getting the client to sign it and then ninjuring it up in the background and the bank doesn't get an opportunity to retain, some of the banks have got very sneaky and they're asking the client to ring up for the discharge. So if we've gone through all the work, we've done all the paperwork, we've signed off on all the documents and we signed off on the discharge at the end of the game, we put it in, the bank comes back going, cool, I'm going to give you a better rate than what you've applied for, please stay. So what we want to do is we want to reverse that. We want them to tell us up front. And if they're not playing the games, the retention team, sometimes the computer is not like the retention team. The retention team's a person, jumps on the phone and says, hey, Joe, I'm going to give you this instead if you cancel your discharge. Great question that's popped up here. What yield should an investor target? for in, in this in current environment i mean it's, it's a bit tough tough one to answer to look good to the banks um the the interesting part i find about this question is that last bit in the current environment to look good for the banks um is there an ideal yield that that the banks love the most what does it look like so th there are some banks that have policies around capping yields yeah, so not going too too nuts on the yields, and there are banks that don't care about the yields, and there's also where we were talking before where rents are taken I at eighty percent. I think you gave me a client 90. that had a six percent cap. You said, Joe, you need to find them a six percent rental yield, yeah. um, and we found it. It worked. It was great, but um, <laughs> I was like, what the hell? Are you? <laughs> okay, and just challenge accepted. Just, just <laughs> there you go. You just needed to. Needed to oh, dig go down deep. Go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was it. So it's all individualized. So what is your income? What is the yield? And um, how how is it going to work in your portfolio? Um, yeah. There's people that have the big variability of income that can hold, say, the the two percent yields, and there's people that have more fixed income that the only variability in their income set is the property. And that, and their surplus money they can use to prop it up in an upwards interest rate environment can make it a little difficult. So it's not it's not necessarily what looks good for the lender. It's what you can afford, and it's also how you going. It's not necessarily if you can get it approved. It's how you're going to afford it in the future because you want to set up for success, not for failure. And I'd I'd say on top of that, uh, the first thing that I would say is like, what goal are you going for? Right, so if you're going for a refinance, then obviously the easiest refinance is that, Aaron, you probably come up against uh, like cash flow properties, right? Mm. Cash flow positive properties, sorry, which is like a property that is paying for itself because most banks will say, that's great, you can pay it back just off the cash flow. And now if you've got, um, and I just want to be specific for this, like if you've got a, a house in Queensland and you're getting a seven, eight, nine percent gross rental yield, the fees of council rates, insurance, et cetera, are higher, which means that your net rental yield is lower. But then if you're comparing that to a house that you buy in Victoria or WA or something or Western Australia, like it's going to be a lower gross rental yield, but then the cost of councils, et cetera, mm. is going to be lower. Great question. So the thing that great, I would great. say to that is Good if thing. you're going for a refinance, go off the net amount um, and then – play back on what Aaron was saying, which is like your personal income and all those kind of things. If you haven't gone negative, et cetera, which is why you should talk to a mortgage broker like Aaron. But the second one is if you're looking to purchase a property um, and you're saying, well, what is the lowest interest rate? Uh, what is the lowest um, yield that I should go for on what I'm purchasing? Think about what Aaron said previously, which was the second order and third order consequences of it, right? So if you're pushing up against a property, 
but you're leveraging all of your income and you're never going to be able to buy another one for two, three, four, five years, then all that matters is that serviceability. Like, uh, what is yeah. the net rental yield? Are you going for a cash flow play? Are you going for a capital growth play? There's just so many variables in that. 